So, yeah, today we are going to talk about uh, linear and affine transformations. I uh, already said last time we introduced the matrix multiplication. I already said that a vector can be seen as a special kind of a matrix, namely a matrix with n rows and one column. And if we do that, then we can multiply it with a mat the vector with the matrix. So multiply a matrix with a matrix and then we get another matrix which because of how we defined vector multiplication is again a matrix with the number of rows that the second matrix had and the uh, the first matrix had and the columns that the second matrix had and if the second is a vector then of course the result is again a vector so you see here again for example in the Where's my mouse pointer here? In the 3D case, we said we multiply the coefficients with each other, A11 with X, A12 with Y, A13 with Z, and then we sum them up. So we get here one new coefficient, so and the same for the other coefficient. So we get here, again, a three-dimensional vector. <clears throat> and then I said at the end that we can use this, for, of course, to manipulate, to transform vectors. And I gave you the example, uh, or I think I gave you the example of multiplying a vector in 2D, for example, with the matrix 2002, 0, 0, uh, 2, 0, 0, sorry. And then we get, as a result, a vector with where both coefficients are twice as large. So we get a vector that is scaled by the factor of 2. So if this is, for example, our vector, then if you multiply the x and the y component with 2, then we get a vector which is twice as long, so we scaled it by the factor of 2. And we can do this, of course, with all the vectors that represent this object, and then we get an object which is scaled by the factor of 2 with respect to the origin, of course, because the original vectors were also uh, written there with respect to the origin. So you see this is a very simple method to transform, to change the vector, to manipulate it, to, to scale it, and uh, now we will talk about more general forms to do all kinds of transformations with vectors. And <clears throat> when we do this with matrices, we say we ha do a so-called linear transformation, and the formal definition of a linear transformation is if we apply a transform uh, the, the formal uh, definition of a linear in transformation contains two conditions that have to be fulfilled that we can call it a linear transformation. And the first one is that if we apply this transformation to a vector, which is the sum of two vectors, we get the same result as if we apply the transformation to each vector individually and then create the sum of the resulting vectors after the transformation. So if we have a vector, for example, v and a vector u, and then we have the sum of this vector, if we apply the transformation to the sum of this vector, we get the same result as if we apply the transformation to the vectors individually and then make the sum of these individually transformed vectors. And uh, of course for the scaling you see obviously that this works because if we scale this here by a factor of two or if we scale this here we get the same results. Now <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, and the second condition that has to be fulfilled is related to multiplication of a vector with a scalar. If we have a vector that is the scalar multiple of another vector, we get the same result when we apply the transformation to this vector than if we apply the transformation to the individual vector and then multiply it with the scalar. And if these two conditions are fulfilled, then we say it is a linear transformation and we can prove, I will not do this, but we can prove that uh, matrix, matrix multiplication is indeed a linear transformation. So if we apply a matrix to a vector, then we have, we can say we have a linear transformation. And this is important as we will see later because that defines what kind of, gives us information about what kind of characteristics transformation of vectors with mat matrix multiplication has and what kind of transformations we can do with it and what we can't do. Um, alternatively, we can combine these two conditions into one, which is basically instead of just having the sum and the scalar separate, we have it combined into one. You can also formally prove that these are equivalent. So if it fulfills this condition, which is sometimes easier to write and to prove, um, or less work to write when you prove it, um, <clears throat> is uh, if it fulfills this condition, then it also fulfills the other two conditions and the other way around. So this is an equivalent definition of a linear transformation. 
Good. So let's look at some, some examples. We already saw scaling by a factor of two. And uh, of course, if you look at the multiplication, it's clear why this is a scaling a factor of two, because if you have here the x and y, and because you have only a value here at this first component, then of course, the result is the first component of this here multiplied with the coefficient that you have here. And if this is not a two, but another value, of course, then you scale by another value. So this is obvious that this is a scaling, mac fact, uh, scaling matrix by scaling in, x co uh, in the x direction by the factor of uh, a11 and in the y direction by the coefficient a22. So we'll look at 2D transformations first and later at the end uh, I will talk about 3D, but first 2D because that's of course easier to understand at the beginning and the 3D later you will see it's mostly just a generalization of the 2D case. Good, so uh, we know now how we can do scaling, but of course these, these coefficients by, by random factor by choosing this AII, A11, A22 at random values. But of course, this doesn't ha don't have to be the same values and it doesn't always have to be something that enlarges an object. We can also shrink an object by that by choosing a value that is smaller than one. And for example, here we did, like we did here, for example, in the first case, the first factor is one half. So the X value is shrinked by half its size and the second factor is a three so the second uh, the y value is increased or it's tripled its size so you see here if you apply this to all the vectors that define this object in x direction it gets half as far away from the origin or smaller and in the y direction it increases its, its size by a factor of two or three now um the question here is what is the inverse of a matrix and when I put the slides together for this talk I realized that uh, last time I said you will learn how to do the inverse of a matrix with Gaussian elimination in the tutorials but I forgot that the next tutorial will only be available on Tuesday and uh, I already need that today so I have to quickly uh, summarize how we do uh, Gaussian elimination here um, to calculate the inverse of a matrix and the trick is simply just instead of having the vector b here where you have the, the result of your equations you just put the identity matrix here so this is like in, Gauss, uh, in the Gaussian elimination this is your matrix A and this is your identity matrix and then you do the same operations that you're allowed to do with the Gaussian elimination till you have here the identity matrix, so that's the same uh, as if you just want to solve the linear equation system. But on the right side, of course, now you have a matrix because here you didn't have a vector, but you had the, uh, the identity matrix. And this matrix is, of course, uh, that's why we're doing it. This is exactly the inverse matrix of this original matrix. So this is pretty simple, the procedure. That's why I didn't explain it last time in the lecture, but I said it's so simple that you can do it also in the exercises. But yeah, my apologies. I forgot that the exercise will not be available today. So, but you know it now. Yeah, it's really quite simple. And you already see how we calculated the inverse of this matrix here. We basically uh, applied this uh, one rule where we can do a multiple uh, multiplication of the of the line with a constant factor doesn't change the result so here we multiply it with two and here we multiply it with one third and then we get of course at the beginning the identity matrix and in the end we get the inverse matrix now we know now how to calculate it the, qu the interesting question is of course why why do we want to do that and uh, of course the answer is um, we're looking into transformations and if you apply a transformation to an object and then you have the inverse transformation and apply it to the same object because it's the inverse transformation you get back to the very same object you can look at this with this example you will see if you try it with this example you will see if you apply here this is what happens when you apply the matrix the transformation matrix a to the yellow square here and if you apply now the uh, inverse transformation to the green object, you will get again to the yellow object. And this is important in graphics as we will see later because in graphics we often have the situation that we, uh, we want to do something with an object but it is very difficult to cal do the calculation but if we transform it and put it for example somewhere else we can do the transformations much easier. So it's quite 
sim quite easy then to just transform it, do the simple operations, and then transform it back. And then we have the original object where we have to uh, we have done our manipulations. We will see examples for this later. But this is why the inverse matrix is so important in relation to transformations. Good. Yeah. Another projection that we could do, obviously, with a transformation is an orthographic projection. So orthographic projection, for example, towards the x-axis. So the idea is you have the, the, for example, a rectangle here, and you want to project it to the x to the y-axis. And then you do this, of course, if you look at what happens to the points here, all x values become zero, and the y values don't change. So if you put a zero in the only zeros in the first line, you will see that you see easily that the x value is always set to zero, and if you put all zeros but one one in the last line of the of the uh, matrix you will see you see easily that the result is just the y value so the y value doesn't change so this is exactly what we want with this orthographic projection now again the interesting question is what is the inverse of this so we can return this uh, operation now if you remember Gaussian elimination last time that we had and what kind of operations we can do you will see that with this first line, we will never be able to turn this first line into one zero. Because here we have a zero and here there is a zero, so we can nothing add here and we can multiplication doesn't change the zero. So this here is not possible, the left part. We will never be able to achieve that. So we cannot solve this with Gaussian elimination and that means the inverse of this matrix doesn't exist. So from an arith arithmetic point of view, we can say we cannot calculate the inverse operation of this transformation. And if you look at the image, you will see that it also doesn't make sense from a geometric point of view, because in that case, if you know this here, you can always come to this object. It's a uniquely defined operation as the inverse of here, whereas here, you're losing information. You don't know from the projected object what was your what could the original object have looked like, because you can have an infinite number of objects that you can project here. So this is also from a geometric point of view. It doesn't really make sense because you would change the object from a line to a square. Good. Another uh, uh, transformation uh, is, for example, a reflection. If we want to reflect something with respect to a line, for example, let's say the line y equals x, so this blue line here in the image, and then we have a square and we want to calculate the reflection of it. If we think about what happens to points when we reflect them to the line x equals y, uh, let's choose that one because that has a zero, that's always then a special case. So this is, for example, three and one. And if you look, if it reflects, it basically just switches the X and Y coordinate. So the one becomes, the three becomes a one and the one becomes a three or the X becomes the Y value and the Y value turns into the X value. So, and by doing a matrix where we have zero, one, one, zero, we can easily do that. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's obviously clear that this uh, gives us exactly this kind of reflection that we want with this vector. Now, the inverse of that matrix, um, here we can, if we use Gaussian, we can apply the one rule that we didn't apply last time in this example that I showed, which is just switching the order of the lines. And if you do that, then you immediately see here that you already have here, or immediately have here the inverse matrix. And if on the right side you have the identity matrix and then you switch it, you will see that the result is this matrix, which is exactly the same as the one we have here for the initial. So in that case, the inverse matrix of A is the same as A, again, from an arithmetical point of view, but also if you look at it from a geometrical point of view, this makes sense because if you reflect something on a line and then you want to reverse that operation and reflect it back, you do the very same operation again. You just reflect on the line because it didn't say anything about which position of the line it has to be. So it's again just exchanging of the coordinates. So the matrix for this is exactly the same. Good. Another operation we can do with matrices easily is shearing. Um, shearing is um, yeah, an operation. It's not that uh, common term. It's basically pushing things to one side. So like you see here in the image, this is shearing in X direction. So we take an object and then we push everything in 
x direction, but depending on where it is on the y axis, the further up it is, the more we push it to the right. If you look at how it is defined, we have the matrix here with two ones at the top and a zero and a one at the bottom. That means that the y value doesn't change. So you see here all these values here stay the same after the operation. They don't change their position on the y axis, but you see that on the x axis they are something is added, namely the y value. So the, li the higher it is up on the y axis, the more it is pushed in x direction. And that is clearly visible here. The more it is up, the more it is pushed to the side. So you get this image where things push to the side. Of course, we don't necessarily have to push in the x direction. We can also create the matrix in a way that we push along the y axis. So we push the, uh, we increase the values of the y uh, of the second coordinate with this uh, other matrix we have here. Um, <clears throat> and of course we don't have to always push it by the value of y but we can also push it by multiples of the value of y so this is the general case of a shearing fact of a matrix where we have a factor s here which is then added with this y to the x value. Good, and if we apply Gaussian to it you see that the you will see that the inverse of this operation is the same as here but with a minus in front of the s and that also makes sense geometrically because if you think about what you have to do when you did this shearing when you push things to the side and then you want to recreate the original object by implying the inverse operation well you just push it back by the same amount you've pushed it first in this direction now you push it in the other direction so you have a factor s with just a negative value good yeah. Another operation we often want to do in graphics is, of course, rotation. This is the matrix for a rotation around the origin with the angle 45 degree in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, the numbers here look a little weird. I put it in the numbers here because later when I write it down, it's easier to write in numbers than with uh, trigon trigonometric uh, function values. But you can also use the trigon. Uh, usually we write down the trigonometric values. So this one here at the bottom is the common matrix for rotation around the origin about the angle 45 degree counterclockwise. We can also, of course, use a different angle and then we just have to replace the 45 degree in the formula in the matrix with uh, rank, an angle, for example, phi. And um, <clears throat> uh, now this is, again, as I said, a counterclockwise operation. So we have here the angle phi and we rotate this object in this direction. Now, if we want to do a clockwise operation, we get this matrix, we have to use this matrix here. And uh, if you know the matrix on top, this and the bottom is quite easily to figure out because if we want to rotate clockwise, it's basically the same as if we rotate about the same angle in a negative direction. So if we rotate, if we use that matrix and rotate by the angle minus phi, we get the same as a counterclockwise uh, rotation in the direction of the angle phi. And um, we know that the, uh, the cosine is axis symmetric. So the cosine of minus phi is the cosine, whereas the sine is point symmetric, which means that the cosine, uh, the sine of minus phi is minus the sine of phi. Now, if we put this here in this matrix, we easily see why I claimed that the second one is the matrix for counterclockwise rotation. So uh, that's pretty easy, but of course, still the question remains, why is this first matrix a matrix for a counterclockwise rotation? And uh, all the other examples that I showed you, I explained to you why this matrix illustrates this kind of operation. And I think it was quite easy for you, I hope, to really understand it. We just looked at the values and said, okay, this is obvious that this matrix must do this kind of operation or must have this consequence in a tra if we apply a trans it as a transformation to a vector. But of course, there are situations where it's not that easy to see what would be a matrix that does this kind of transformation. For example, here, at least for me, I don't immediately see why cosine and minus sine and sine and cosine is a rotation matrix. So the question is, how can we 
assign these uh, values to achieve a specific operation uh, a specific transformation and this is a good situation to uh, compete i was i know I, I was rushing a lot to the first part here but it's 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 so straightforward so it's it's too boring if i drag on this too long but let's uh, just repeat a little bit uh, repeat quickly what what i've done we introduced matrices for scaling shearing reflection and rotation um and uh just to repeat, let's apply them to the two basis vectors of a Cartesian coordinate, coordinate system, which is B1 is 1, 0, and B2 is 0, 1. So I said the scaling is this matrix, so if we apply this to B1, which is 1, 0, we get A0, which is A times the, factor, the vector B1, which makes sense because the second was 0 uh, before that uh, anyhow, so that doesn't scale. And the second, the same for the second vector, and here we just have the first coordinate stays the same, but the second one becomes B. For the shearing, we see that the y value doesn't change, so this remains here 0, and here it remains 1. And the first coordinate, we see that both coordinates are added, which in the first case, of course, is a 1, and in the second case is also a 1. For the reflection, we said that we just exchange the, the matrix, just the consequence of applying the matrix to the vector is just that we exchange the coordinates. So we get this result here if we apply to these two vectors. And in the third case, we get square root of 2 divided by 2 times and the vector 1, 1. So this is just easier for me to write and easier for you to read, I guess. Uh, so, good. So we have, I have done this now to, to repeat a little bit, but if you remember the question before when I said, how can we get these kind of transformation matrices? How do we know what kind of values we have to put in there to achieve a certain operation? If you compare now what you get when you apply this matrix to the base vectors, with the matrix itself. Then you see, of course, the column vectors of this matrix of these matrices are exactly the images of the base ma ma uh, the images of the base vectors when we apply the transformation to it. And this is no coincidence. I just said that. This is no coincidence. And here it comes into play that matrix multiplication is a linear transformation. Because if you think about it, so, so this is just, uh, remember this is what the one condition that has to be fulfilled when you have a linear transformation. Now you also remember we said uh, in an earlier lecture when we use the Cartesian coordinate system, we can write each vector as a linear combination of the base vectors. So if we have a vector x, y, we can write it x times base vector 1 plus y times base vector 2. Now if you take this vector and apply any linear transformation to it, then you can, of course, because it's a linear transformation, put the factors in front, do the transformation with the individual vector, and then add them up. Now. If you, if you look at, for example, this here, what you have here, you see because how this vector is made, what kind of vector we have here, um, and it also works with, with higher dimensions, if you have 1, 0, and then only zeros, because you just have this one value of 1 here and everything else is 0, the result will always be the first column of this matrix. And that means, if you think about it the other way around, if you want to know what is the matrix that creates me this kind of image, you just have to think, uh, that, that does this kind of operation, you just have to think about how would the base vector look like if I would apply the transformation to it, and then you have exactly your first column of your matrix. Then you do it for the second base vector, and then you have your matrix, or for the third if you're in 3D. So let's look now at this uh, example of the, of the rotation. Um, that we have. So uh, can we prove by this that this is really a rotation around the angle phi, a counterclockwise rotation around the angle phi? So let's do this for the first base vector. If we look at, if we have a first base vector, B1, 1, 0, and we want to rotate that by an angle phi to x1, y1, uh, or B1, uh, I call it B1 dash, this, this uh, base vector. 
Now if we look at this, we know that here we have a triangle with the right angle, and these here are um, the coordinates of this vector. Now we also know from trigonometry that the uh, cosine of phi is xy divided by the length of this vector, which conveniently is 1 because we're in a Cartesian coordinate system, so we have unit vector here. And we know that the sine of phi is y1 divided by 1. And that is exactly the first co uh, column we have in our matrix. And we can do this for the second base vector and then we'll get to the second column. So we see here now what was not obvious for us, now it becomes pretty clear. Good, so now we can make um, single, single transformations, but of course we can also make multiple transformations. If we transform an object, why should we not apply another matrix to it to make a second transformation? So for example, if we have this yellow square here, we can reflect it here with this first matrix, and then we can make a scaling with the second matrix. And since we know that matrix multiplication is associative, we could also just take these two matrices, multiply them, and then multiply it with the vector. That would also work. And then, so we have one single matrix that gives us this transformation instead of having to do the single transformations. So we know now we can make much more complicated transformations in one step by combining the individual transformation matrices. But we have to be careful in which order we combine them because we also learned last time that matrix multiplication is not commutative. So if we apply oops, this matrix first, the, the, the reflection, and then the scaling, we get a different result than if we apply the, the, the scaling first and then the reflection. And that also makes sense from the, from the image because if you would apply here the scaling first and then the, 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 uh, the reflection, you would see that you get a different result. So the order is important and be careful that the order in, how, uh, in which order you multiply it with the vector counts. So if you want to do the reflection first, you don't write the reflection matrix first, you write the reflection matrix first closest to the vector. So you have to write it from that direction or you have to read it from that direction if you want to know what kind of operations are done here. Then the first operation is of course the reflection and not the first one on the left side. Good. Now there is, uh, so we can do these transformations, but we also know that um, we often need normal vectors to do, for example, lighting calculations. And unfortunately, if we have a normal vector and apply a transformation matrix to it, it doesn't always work. Because, for example, with shearing, if we have this normal vector and then we apply the transformation to it, that would be the correct normal vector, but if we apply a transformation matrix to it, of course, the vector doesn't change its direction, so it's still this one, which is wrong. And that would be the correct one. So we have to do something special here. Fortunately, the tangent vector pl uh, stay the same. So the tangent vector is the vector that is basically we, we, that we use to, to, to define what a normal vector is, namely by saying the tangent, the normal vector is the perpendicular vector to the tangent vector at this particular point. And that, fortunately, does translate correctly. And we can use this to prove why the application of this here, of this matrix to the normal vector, delivers us the correct normal vector. So let's do this proof here. Um, <clears throat> so we know, so a little more formally, uh, we know tangent vectors are translated correctly by applying the transformation matrix. So the transformed tangent vector is again a tangent vector now for the transformed object. But we know that normal vectors, because we saw it in this previous example, normal vectors are not transformed correctly. So if we apply the matrix to a normal vector, the result is not the correct normal vector. So <coughs> what we want to have is we want to find a matrix now that if we apply it to, an, that is related to this transformation A, but if we apply it to a normal vector, it is the right normal vector for this object that we created with, transform, uh, with using transformation matrix A. 
that was a complicated sentence. I think it was correct, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 th I hope you, you, you understand what I mean. So we want to have a matrix and we want to apply that to a normal vector, that this normal vector is the correct normal vector for this transformed object. Now we know that the normal vector multiplied with the, trans, uh, with the uh, uh, tangent vector is on a right angle, uh, the normal vector is to, in the right angle to the tangent vector, which means if we multiply it with the, the dot product, we get uh, zero. Now we can also write this in this way that we just put the identity matrix in here because we learned last time multiplying a vector with this identity matrix doesn't change the vector, so we can just write it in there. But if we do that, then we can also write it this way because we also learned that the identity matrix uh, is the same as the inverse matrix multiplied with the matrix because that's was how the inverse matrix was defined. Now the reason why I'm writing it that way is that way we can pretty easily see how what our matrix is that we have to apply here because um, if we look at this, this AT this is exactly our tangent vector TA. But that means, because the product of this is zero, that this vector here must be in a right angle to this tangent vector. So here we have a vector that is in a right angle to the correctly transformed tangent vector. So this is one of the normal vectors, or this is a possible normal vector that we want to find. The only problem that we have here is that uh, it is the transpose of it, so we need to make the transpose. So this is the vector that we have, but the only problem is it is the transpose, so we want to have it not transpose, so we have to make the transpose of a transpose to get the, the original vector again. And um, yeah, 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 I was writing two steps at once. So, yeah, we have to make the transpose of transpose, and we know that this is also, again, from last time, I have proven this one thing, that this is a, the inverse matrix transposed times the normal vector, and that way we see that this is our normal vector um, how did I call it, nn, this is exactly the normal vector that we were looking for. And then we know that this is exactly this matrix that I just dropped here and didn't explain why, and now we see the proof why this is indeed correct. Good. So uh, <clears throat> now we can do single transformations, we can do multiple, combine multiple transformations. We also need to know, need how we deal with um, um, with uh, normal vectors, and because we can combine transformations, we can already do some very complex things, but we had a lot of operations that were, um, or, no, no, let, um, uh, let's say that we, let's say that way, we, we, uh, we know now we can do a lot of complex things. So for example, we can combine, uh, we can create a rotation around a random point by combining translations, uh, by com by combining transformations. So for example, we can take the point, uh, take the object, translate it to the origin, then do our rotation. So first we translate it to the origin, we move it to the origin, then we do a rotation, and then we move it back. And then we have achieved a rotation around this random point, because we know now how to ran rotate around a center, so by just, but we don't know how to rotate, uh, we, we know now how to rotate around the origin, but we don't know how to rotate around a random point. By, by, by combining these trans, translate, transformations, we could, we could do that if we know what the matrix for translation is. Unfortunately, there is no such matrix because a translation is not a linear transformation. So, um, <clears throat> and we can easily see that, that because if we do a linear transformation, we always get a result like this here. But what we want is a result like this. We want to have like this xy plus a certain value xt or yt. But we see here 
because it always depends on the y value or here on the x value. So it can either be zero or something that is not constant, that is always depending on the other coefficient. So this is why we cannot do a translation. But the good news is that we can extend our matrix framework to do something that is called affine transformations and then we can still use matrix multiplication to do translations. And the idea is basically to move one dimension upwards. And the motivation for this is you can understand this easily by looking at shearing. So for example, if you look at shearing in 2D, where we move, for example, this part of the object, uh, where we shear this part of the object over here by applying this shearing matrix, if you look at the 2D projection of this, if you project of the 1D projection of this, if you look at this in this one dimension here, x, then you see this is pretty much moving this line over to here. Same for the 2D case. If you look at this block here and then you apply a shearing, if you look at the projection of the sheared document, of uh, the shear object here, sheared object here, this is pretty much the same as if you would move this object over here. And that is the basic idea of the so-called homogeneous coordinates. So the idea is if we want to move in 2D, so let's look at the 2D case now, we just add a third dimension to a shearing and then we project it back. So let's say we have a point x, y here. We want to move that to a different position. Then we just create a third dimension to it by just adding a factor, a uh, third coefficient x, y, d. Let's just call it d. So that is d for distance. We do this for all the points, of course, that we want to move. Then we apply, oh, I, that was the wrong image. It should go here. Oops, okay. Yeah, but yeah, I can also draw it here and do it in one step. So this is step one, this is step two, forget about that. And this is step three, which is basically applying, uh, let's call it MS matrix for shearing. We do a shearing and then we get our, our point here has then the values X plus some delta, which is the factor around where we sheared plus Y delta plus d, because you see this dimension didn't change, because the, the last value in the shearing, if we shear in that direction, stays the same. And now we just have to project that point to here, and that is easily done by just throwing that away. And then we have exactly our vector x plus delta, y plus delta, which is moving that object or that vector or that position over, that point over to here by going the uh, detour over the other dimension. And uh, of course we can also extend this to the third dimension, so if we want to do sh um, a translation in 3D we have to extend it to 4D as we will see later. So, uh, oh yeah, that's all, already it. So the, the shearing in 3D is then basically a generalization of the, the shearing in 2D. So, uh, but this is Actually, yes, this sentence doesn't make much sense here. This is still, uh, we're still in the, in the, oh, no, no. Uh, it's, <laughs> I'm a little confused today, sorry. Um, yeah. So the, uh, when we want to do shearing in 2D, we just add a third dimension, and then we have shearing in, th when we, no. Okay, again, when we want to do, uh, I, I was at the symposium this morning, so I already talked half a day, so my apologies. Um, if we do a translation in 2D, we go to the third dimension, do a shearing in 3D, and then we can, easy, we can go back to 2D, and then we have a translation in 2D. And that's what I've done here by adding this distance D, and then if you apply this with a vector where you just have another, or here it's called set or a distance d, then you will see with the shearing you get this here, but this is not exactly what we want, but almost what we want. What we want is a constant factor, so what we have to do is this distance d, we just set this distance d to 1. 
So D, if we put it to one, then we have exactly for X and Y the effects that we want to have. And then we can do the shearing in 3D and then we throw away the third coordinate and then we have a translation in 2D. Good. So, yeah, this is basically what I just said and we want to do this um, if we want to do this. So if we want to do this, we have to basically just extend our matrix. So instead of having a 2D matrix, for example, for the scaling, we had 2, 0, 0, 2, that multi uh, modified our two-dimensional vector. If we want to do a shearing, we have to go to the third dimension. So we just have to make a 3 cos 3 matrix and then write the shearing values here and the lower line is 0, 0, 1 because that pushes everything to the third dimension, uh, to, the, to the plane 1 in which we want to do the shearing. The question now is, of course, how do we represent vectors? Because if we have the vector x, y here, we cannot multiply it because one coordinate is missing for the matrix multiplication. And the solution to this is we just basically also move this vector into the, the, the plane of z equals y. So we just put the z value fixed to 1. The only thing we have to be careful now is this is one of the uh, moments where uh, what I always warned you about at the beginning and you probably didn't understand why he's making such a big fuss about it. Vectors are different than locations. So if we want to move a vector that represents a location, then of course we write a 1 here. But if we for example have a vector that represents just a direction and a length and we want to scale that vector, so we just want to increase the length by 2, but do not want to change the direction or do anything else with it, then we cannot like translate it. We just want to change the direction, uh, change the length. So then we cannot, uh, if, if we put a 1 here, then we get a different, no, then we have the problem that if we do a translation, we move the, the vector, but the vector doesn't have a location. So we have to make sure that this doesn't happen and we can do this by just putting a zero here. So this is how we distinguish with the homogeneous coordinates between a location and a vector. We just have a one for a location and a zero for a vector. So um, <clears throat> yeah, and then you see if you apply this, if you do, for example, if you have a scaling and uh, then a translation applied to a location or a, an object, you see you can combine this into one matrix, this matrix here, and then you apply it and then you get exactly what you want. You get the first the coordinates scaled and then moved by xt and yt. Now if you apply this to a vector where you have a zero here, you see the very same matrix only scales the vector but it doesn't translate it, which is exactly what we want because we said vectors cannot be moved because vectors don't have a location, they are an abstract construct, we can use it to describe a location, then we have the one here, but if we use them as a vector and want to change the vector by translation matrix, uh, by a transformation matrix, not a translation, transformation matrix, then we have to put a zero here and then it does not get translated. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's... Uh, make a break here. I think I also need a break today. All right, 15 minutes break.